dog is protected, the dog is a, is a beneficent animal, but also can sense whether the person is alive or not. Just to make a comment, with your permission, uh, since you mentioned that Zoroastrian religion has influenced other religions, uh, I remember reading Professor Mary Boyce of a School of Oriental and African Studies. She says that the concept of Sashoyan, uh, I will spell it because of my pronunciation, S-A-S-O, I'm sorry, S-A-S-H-O-Y-A-N-T, was the origin of the concept of Messiah, which went to all other religions. That's probably the voices. Mm -hmm. Yes, the curve of Zoroastrianism refers to the concept. You know, messianism and messiah. Now, yes, I, I come mean, from a Buddhist background. Yes. The concept of my prayer came much after Buddha's death. That there is a second Buddha coming and so on. Maybe uh, Professor will uh, comment on that. So I just want to mention the concept of Sakshoya. Can I take this off? Sure. I'm, I'm not a uh, scholar of religion, but of art history. <laughs> but but it is, there, there, in the text, there is this messianic um, cast, and it's possible that it influenced other religions. You could probably speak better to that than I can. Well, there's some, I mean, there are some people who speculate that during the period of Persian rule of uh, Israel, but that was one of the times at which you have, for instance, um, some of these kind of early ideas coming in and at least shaping the way that Jews and, and thus later Christians are kind of reading earlier traditions. Um, it seems in these cases, it's not something as simple as uh, just adopting a, a Zoroastrians inventing a concept of Messiah and then someone else taking it as if it's a light bulb, or, you know. Um, but rather, there's probably something within the tradition already that is it's developed or given a kind of extra um, different language to put in it, which is I think what you, what most because of the difficulties of dating some of these traditions, what most people would say with regard to at least concepts of Messiah and Judaism and later Christianity as they developed. Um, in ways that seem similar to Zoroastrianism as we also know it. Well, even the concept of heaven and hell, which as I understand it in, in Judaism, it, it, it's a rather, there really isn't that, but with Hellenism coming in and also exposure to Zoroastrianism, that we get to get a, a greater um, sense, even in Judaism, of a heaven and hell. But hell is a very light. I, I would say, in terms of messianism and Buddhism, the Maitreya, the idea of a savior Buddha coming um, in 2447 years uh, from now, uh, mark, mark it down, um, <laughs> that, uh, um, that there was a concept of many Buddhas, and so a next Buddha isn't surprising, but this idea that this Buddha would save the earth from what that time would be in a terrible uh, condition, actually, the earliest evidence we have of the idea of Maitreya is from the Silk Road and Gandhara, right around this area. So there's some, some Buddhist scholars believe that the concept of a messianic Buddha is influenced by Zoroastrianism. But I would also say, just as Gina said, that if you want to find Zoroastrianism everywhere, you can. Um, I mean, you, it can be the origins of everything if you look hard enough. Um, and so, but I think, I think Professor Reed is <laughs> more correct in saying that these are elements that are found in a lot of religions that might be more emphasized than others. And I think you also have to remember that these people live next to each other. For example, in Gandhara and Afghanistan, um, the, the people in Afghanistan are Bactrians, they're Iranians. Many of them have good Mazdian names, and yet there are Buddhist monasteries, and many of them are Buddhists. So. There's a lot of cross-fertilization here. What do you attribute the decline popularity of the religion? I mean, it's not one of the major religions right now. Was it ever considered a major religion? It was a major religion in Iran, and uh, that was a great empire that extended from Iraq uh, all the way into Afghanistan, and you had influence before, and then, and then you had Eastern Iranian people in Central Asia who were also Zoroastrians or Mazdians, whatever you want to call them. But it was really under Islam. Islam took over 
and Zoroastrianism, um, many, many Zoroastrians went to India. And that's why we have the Parsis um, in India, and they really have the largest um, Zoroastrian community in, in the world, even though there are still Iran Zoroastrians in Iran. But um, Zoroastrianism then doesn't really, it kind of peters out, you know, because Islam is just so vital and takes over. Yes, please. Yes, a question about Islam. Yes, if you will. Uh, it seems like countries or large areas that are dominated politically by either Shia or Sunni. Are there any? Um, yes, are there anywhere the Sufis dominate politically? That's a good question. And um, 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 it impels me to make the distinction uh, again that. Um, uh, Shiism and, and, and Shi and Sunni Islam are sects in, this, in the same way that one speaks of, say, um, Protestants and Catholics, right? in Christianity. Sufism is not a sect. So one can, in principle, uh, Sufism is, is rather an approach to being Muslim. Um, it, it doesn't involve uh, following a particular legal traditions. so that, uh, in principle, one could be a Sunni and a Sufi, a Shiite and a, and a Sufi. Uh, it, it simply means being a mystic, in the same way that you could have Catholic mystics and Protestant mystics. Um, so, um, uh, that said, I would say, historically, since I am a historian, most, most Sufis tend to be Sunnis. Um, uh, as for Sufis being uh, in charge, or Sufis being dominant in, say, the religious expression of a particular country, um, Sufism terms up mostly as, as in liberation movements, actually, what we would call today, rather than in governments. Um, you find it a lot kind of neo-Sufism in, say, North Africa, um, in Chechnya, um, in places uh, where uh, isolated religious communities found a kind of spiritual leadership amongst Sufis as part of their religious struggle against um, outsiders, colonialists, or, or what have you. But governments, I'm trying to think, not so much. Do mystics make good politicians? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was given the, the task of, of uh, writing a book on Islam, and I was given the To whom are you asking the question, Prima? It's to all of you. It's like, yeah. anybody can answer Islam, maybe Islam, yes. Mm. <laughs> 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 well, you, could you what find the question? Sure, the, the, the question was, um, uh, we've traced here uh, the remarkable spread east and west of religions. Um, how come uh, none of them really took um, in China? Is that the general answer? Well, the, I, think, I think the proper answer is, well, actually they did, as, as I think uh, 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 everyone has, has shown, um, and I think most dramatically in that case. Um, Jews in China, who knew? Um, um, but um, I would be foolish if I thought I could answer that question uh, right now. It's a very, it's a, it's a huge question. And uh, well outside my expertise, but you have a you have a guess. Well, I, I mean, I think that to some degree. I mean, I can only speak to the the individual cases that I mm. I've read something about. I mean, thinking about um, Jews, Christians, and Manichees. And in each case, I think that they were they were. It was an interesting. They were managed in interesting ways by the um, governing authorities, where there's a certain space given to them. So it wasn't a sense that they weren't suppressed. They weren't. Um, but they also um, didn't grow that much. Um, so there was some way in which, whenever you read, like all the, the, the very Stella that I put up, for instance, they all include um, statements about the emperor, or statements about uh, promoting, whether it's Judaism or Christianity, as being 
um, a force for social order within a kind of more uh, Chinese cosmology. So I think that that was part, I think there's part of a way in which, um, I mean, also since they all seem to have adopted a kind of Taoist language, of kind of light imagery, um, but at the end of the day, they always seem to be subordinate to it. Um, I mean, I know, because I know that Buddhists also were in a situation initially in China of being uh, legally kind of like Nestorian, so-called Nestorian Christians. But they just seem to have been kind of managed in a way. I, I would support that, uh, not with any evidence of my own, that is the issue of management, but what, from what uh, Judas, Judas said, actually, you did mention Zoroastrians actually being forbidden. Yes. Right? There's a kind of point in time for whatever political reasons in a given situation where a given religious community would be declared illegal by, uh, by the emperor. Well, there was a real reaction after the, um, there was a reaction after the Anushan Rebellion in the middle of the 8th century because he, well, actually he was part Saudi and part Turk. Uh -huh. And um, a good part of the army was made up of foreigners or at least people of foreign origin. And so the Tang Dynasty just kind of closed down. It was a real time of crisis as I understand it. And they just closed down. And so Zoroastrianism and many other religions were just prescribed, but they were still practiced. And then you see, at least for the Zoroastrians who were in China, um, you begin to see how they assimilate. They, they buried, they're buried in Chinese-style tombs. They have epitaphs, when we do have the epitaphs. And we can see they often, they marry um, women also with foreign names, but then some of them take, have a second wife, and she is Han. And gradually, gradually, they, they do assimilate. But the Chinese had given the Central Asians who came to China certain names based on where they came from. And we still have the names today. So Kang, and of course it depends on the character in which it's written, but Kang means originally from Samarkand. An means that your ancestors came from Bukhara. So that continued, but they become more and more Han. Sorry, I'm doing my job. Uh, question for Dr. Ka. Yes. Uh, the Silk Road today is also used as the main thoroughfare for illicit goods mm -hmm. going east west. And these are primarily uh, funded by, we could say, fundamentalist groups mm -hmm. uh, with their rigid ideology. How does the diversity of the Silk Road fit with the Islamization of these countries? If you could care to answer that. And there is a part two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the part the two part is where you put out your crystal ball and look, let's say, two, three decades into the future. How do you see that? And I know you're a historian, but <laughs> if you could play a fortune teller for a moment, too. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, to begin with, uh, um, my, my general response is as a medievalist um, to avoid answering the question at all. <laughs> I, honestly, I honestly don't know the first thing about the region uh, in, in a contemporary setting. But um, um, it, it is an opportunity for me to stress that what we observe of, say, uh, the actions of the Taliban or of um, other hardline, and I use school, uh, the scare quotes um, advisedly, um, Islamic groups um, is a very modern phenomenon. This is, uh, this is a, a, an intellectual and spiritual trend which has very little to do with um, the intellectual uh, history of Islam as I know it and with indeed the practice of Islam in uh, this region, um, which as we've seen, if anything, is uh, characterized by the kind of unity and diversity that I tried to, to stress in my talk. Um, as for the, um, so that's that's as best as I can come to talking about part one, not since I, 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 I simply don't know um, that, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked, shocked how, how, how well informed you are about the trade in illicit goods. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave, put that to one side. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to others to judge. Uh, for the second part, um, I, uh, th again, um, predicting the future is, is the one thing that uh, historians should never do. They're usually embarrassed by it. Um, so um, I, um, 
I really uh, am, am reluctant to. I'm really reluctant to address it. I, it's out of my purview. Even even where I'm modern historian and informed about the region, I would also insist that the future is outside of my purview. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, my question is, did the, do you know if the Silk Road serve as the primary route for most pilgrimages across Asia for any of the religions, but I guess more specifically uh, pilgrimages to Mecca? And is there, like, how feasible was it in the 8th century versus the 15th century? Was it becoming easier because of those, because of the Silk Road? Good question. Um, the pilgrimage route for Central Asians went through Bukhara and then um, took a uh, Louis, as we say, <laughs> to the left to, and headed south into across the Iranian plateau to um, uh, into Iraq and then, and then um, through established pilgrimage routes to Mecca. Um, so, um, and that seems to be pretty well documented from the ninth century onwards. The main issue there, though, is the reliability and safety of the route because of bandits. Um, or um, you know political upheavals. So insofar as pilgrimage traffic vary along this route, and note that it isn't you know once you hit Bukhara, Bukhara the route I'm describing is not a sort of classic silk route. It's a kind of spur. Um, uh, anyway, the fluctuation that you see is due to these kind of uh, random occurrences, um, not so much the the route itself so much as these epiphenomena. Okay, one thing I've always been puzzled about when it comes to Silk Road religions. Okay, from the Middle Eastern end, we get Islam, and kind of in the middle there, we get Zoroastrianism. And from the other end, with India, we get, you know, we get Buddhism. Um, I've always wondered why the Chinese, the more traditional Chinese religions of Taoism and Confucianism, never spread themselves. They never went into the Middle East, or they never went into India, or anywhere else. Why, why these specific religions spread, and the two indigenous Chinese religions never spread? <coughs> did everyone hear that question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why did, well, they, uh, I would say they weren't seeking converts. I, it, 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 I mean, it, Confucian traditions, if you want to call it Confucianism religion, or you want to call it traditional law and family life and you know, beliefs about the cosmos, was not seeking converts. So you could, a Confucian person, first of all, there's not such a thing as a person who's pure, a Confucian pure and simple, that they might practice Taoist beliefs, they might use Taoist medicine and Buddhist astrology, they might read Buddhist texts, they might enjoy Buddhist theater, and they might enjoy um, you know, Taoist poetry is that they're not seeking to convert. So it, there were certainly plenty of people along the Silk Road who knew a lot about Confucian law, who knew a lot about Confucian ideas of uh, predicting the future, prognostication, um, but not, not necessarily established in schools. It was unnecessary. The schools were important for imperial exams. They weren't important for just learning in general. Um, Taoists have you know, generally not sought out converts, and you don't need to man Taoist shrines. Taoist shrines don't need personnel like you would need for a Catholic church, you would need for a Buddhist temple. Um, and so just the, char the character of the religions themselves, even if you want to call them religions, don't, wouldn't need to establish bases that a local community would, would, you know. For example, you can't have an Irish community in Philadelphia that doesn't have a church. They need the church, they need the building, they need the staff, they need, you know, they need the host, they need the law, they need the books. So you need to establish it. A Taoist can move to Philadelphia and, and be a Taoist without any structure and any personnel. Um, and the same thing going, going for the Silk Road. Um, and, uh, but there's plenty of Taoist evidence of, and also a lot of the Buddhist translators knew were translating at the same time Taoist text. And we'll find Taoist text and Buddhist text scrolls right next to each other in caves. Okay, um, so my question is, I guess, for uh, Christianity, uh, so we know that probably Islam was elements from Christianity and Judaism, that's why probably they're all classified as Abrahamic religions. And we learned today that uh, Judaism and Christianity took some of their elements from Zoroastrianism. So, because uh, 
Islam was born in a region that was closer to the origin of Zoroastrianism. I would assume that Islam took some of its elements directly from Zoroastrianism, not through Judaism. So I want to see if that's the case and what are those elements. I'll give it a whirl. <laughs> <laughs> Could you repeat the question? Sure. The, the, uh, it's a very good question. And the question is, um, if you'll permit me to paraphrase, the, que the question was, OK, so Zoroastrianism influenced Judaism and Christianity um, in, in many ways. However, um, uh, Islam, since Islam arose in, in a region uh, close to the um, region in which Zoroastrian, Zoroastrianism emerged, are the influences of Zoroastrian, Zoroastrianism that we see in Islam direct influences, or are they influences via Judaism and Christianity? Yeah. That is a super question, and I um, encourage you to write a dissertation on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 yeah, by all means, I'll pass this over to you. I would speculate, though, that a lot of, a lot of what we see in Islam and Islamic law, um, or yeah, it, uh, are influences from Judaism or Christianity that, that that are indirect. However, there may also be, and I know some, that there's been some scholarly research on this. There, there is evidence for um, uh, Zoroastrian influences, direct influences in uh, Islamic laws of purity, ritual purity washing and uh, clothing and, and, and dress. Um, that's the extent of, extent of my knowledge. So that, but that does make me suspect that there must be more. Okay. Just, just to add uh, to that, um, because the, the center of the of Sassanian Empire was actually in the West, in Tesafon, in Iraq, uh, where you had a, a long established Jewish community and a Christian community, and then you had all these Zoroastrians, and more and more research is being done, and people are looking at it, particularly the legal system. They all talk to each other. And um, in fact, there are laws prescribing intermarriage. And because they were so afraid of intermarriage, that suggests that that was a real threat to the individual communities. So there was a lot of cross-fertilization, and that probably also helped mm -hmm. to influence. I would imagine it's people. difficult to untangle. Yeah, yeah. This is related to the same question. Uh, my impression is that the kind of Islam which was then flourishing and spreading in Persia, the older Persia, and then maybe Iran, has uh, the closest connection to the Zoroastrian um, rituals, as we see. So it's not exactly on the basis the pillars are the same, but the kind of rituals which people practice, mm -hmm. which the kind of uh, spiritual life which is common in the society in Iran has a lot to do with Zoroastrianism and the way, for example, the mornings, the uh, bedding, and yeah. like the same uh, case of mourning you described has still is practiced in Iran, so in the form of Islamic ideas. So I think that this, at the same place which um, Friday had in mind, in his mind, so directly into us. Daily life, daily religious daily, practice, yeah. Uh, as opposed to, as opposed to normative from the law, from Islamic law. Yeah. And it's the version that is practiced in Iran. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly, if you, if you look at many of the, um, the festivals that are observed in Iran, Nowruz, the New Year, that's not Islamic, that's really Zoroastrian. But it's very much a part of Iranian culture and the religion and the culture are very much combined. So, One so. final question that you could choose from your message, <laughs> whom it will be. I was wondering, I know that there are plenty of caravansars along the Silk Road, and I know that the um, kingdoms there would um, fund it. So if two kingdoms were funding one caravansari, if one king went to war with the other king, what would happen? Bravo. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, just, I'm just reiterating the question. I, I still need to ponder the uh, depths of that. Um, the Silk Road was largely fueled by caravan traffic, in which uh, caravans would stop at uh, periodically spaced caravanserais, or khans, uh, these merchant uh, pit stops. Uh, and different kings would um, underwrite them, would, fund, would build them. Um, and sometimes you would have two, and because territory passed from kingdom to kingdom in, in wars and so on, what happens if you have, uh, am I doing this right? If you have two kings, two kings who, funded who funded one of these, and they both go to war, what happens to the, to the caravanserai. You know, that's a good question. Do you have a kind of um, no man's land or... I know, here's what I can tell you. There are cases, lots of cases, where the traffic on the, on the Silk Road is, is stopped. We have cases of travelers not being allowed to go any further uh, because of war. And so, presumably, one of those two kings has to has to claim that caravanserai, right? Claim it as his own, and then won't let any more trade go beyond that point, right? Because then his enemy would get all the, would, would get benefits, you see? So I suspect something like that would happen. I was also wondering, I know that um, it's just a saying that a woman could carry a gold plate on her head, stretch from, start from one end of the Silk Road and go to the other without having to worry. And mm. as dynasties um, rose and fell, would that um, safety change, or how people felt change? Okay, first of all, buddy, we said one question. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, I, yeah, I've heard that too. Um, and the, um, the most famous case is under the Mongols, what they call the Pax Mongolica, where the Mongols um, controlled such a large chunk of the Silk Road and kept law and order uh, in their own inimitable way that trade was trade was easy, safe, and uh, you know proverbial, proverbially safe. You you never have have trouble. But there were but but uh, that example suggests that the opposite was also true a lot. That you could have when governments were weak, bandits, um, highway robbers. Um, and you know rebellions that would interrupt trade. So it's kind of a, it's a fragile, it's a very very important life way in this part of the world with the spread of ideas and commerce and um, goods. It's also very fragile and it requires a kind of either cooperation uh, between different different kings of different regions or the control of, of one one large empire. Um, but just to balance that, I can just speak about the earlier stage, uh, earlier years of the Silk Road, not in Islamic times, but I think there were like free trade zones, and they were all they were always interested in moving the goods across. They what traveled on the Silk Road was so valuable to the senders and the receivers that they made it happen. And when the Sogdians controlled it, and the Sogdians were, although they became military men, in um, some of them who, who moved to China became military men. We don't know them as military men back home. They seem to be agriculturalists and traders. And um, they established the caravans, and they were protected. They hired Turks to protect them. They had these nomadic Turks who would protect them from robbers. And so getting hitched to a caravan, even if you didn't have goods to sell, if you were a pilgrim, for example, you would go with a caravan because it was much safer. I mean, you could still be attacked, but that was the way to go. So people, it was amazing the distances that people moved. And they didn't go from point A to point C necessarily, but they were intermediate stations, and goods would exchange hands there as well. So it's rather complicated. I would think, first of all, Excellent questions. I mean, really, really excellent. I would say it's most likely that gold plate got all the way, but not the woman. <laughs> <laughs> not meaning that she was hurt or she was killed, but she, you know, she she was assigned to go to this distance, and she shifted and she traded, and so goods moved a lot faster and greater distances than the people often. It's not to say that people didn't always, but it's very rare that somebody would travel from Beijing to Istanbul. 
it would be more likely that the plate would travel that way. And so we have, and so when we see like a Roman coin or a Roman lamp in northern Burma or something like this, it doesn't mean that there was a Roman person there. Okay, is that the goods got there, um, and that things were transferred along the way. Um, and then the second thing is that you know, if everybody's making money, everybody's happy. You know, in a, in a sense, is that you know if. Both kings are thinking that they're both getting a profit out of it. Why would they stop it? Why would they stop it? Okay, unfortunately, we need to bring the afternoon to a close. But thank you all for coming. To the next